the shining barrier, the shield of our love, a walled garden, a fence around a young tree to keep the deers from nibbling it, a fortified place with the walls and watchtowers gleaming white like the cliffs of England, the shining barrier, we called it so from the first, protecting the green tree of our love. And yet in another sense, it was our love itself, made strong within, that was the shining barrier. This is Pints with Jack, season five, episode 48, A Severe Mercy Month, part one. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Pints with Jack, your favorite weekly C.S. Lewis podcast, where Andrew, David, and I break down and discuss the works of C.S. Lewis. Minus David today. Yes, minus David. Minus David for the next month. Oh, my gosh. Well, and that's just because I was going to say, not because we got, um, we kicked him out by any stretch of imagination, but David needed, we needed to give David a break. Absolutely. Well, we've finished the four loves. We've had ecumenism month and apologetics month, and now we have severe mercy month. So uh, Matt and I have been reading this uh, famous book by Sheldon Van Auken, and we're going to, we've got a few episodes planned to discuss it. And uh, hopefully they will be equally helpful whether or not you have read the book or you haven't read the book yet. Yes, and this this is going to be a very different month in the sense that the format of these episodes is going to be very different than our typical one. It's We're not going to be necessarily chronologically progressing through the book, although we will be picking up on some of the key events. But the book is very much going to be a launching point to, to discussion between Andrew and myself on this book because it's a powerful story of a pagan love to a divine love. And I, and I won't go into detail yet on that part, but there's a beautiful journey. And this played a very impactful role in my own personal journey. It was right around senior year of Notre Dame. This was after my year at Oxford. And this is when I was coming back to Christianity that I came across this book. And what I loved about it was you have a love story in the beginning, which is actually binary. Some really get turned off by a love story in the beginning, which mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure we'll talk about. And some are, are drawn to it. I was a little bit more neutral, I guess, maybe on the love story side. But pretty quickly, I think it was like actually page 70, it gets into their journey when they're in Oxford. And because I loved Oxford, I felt an affinity to that. I really felt an affinity to the intellectual atmosphere they, des- they describe, the conversations, the books that they were reading, the the stuff they struggle with. Obviously, we're going through this because there's a lot of letters with C.S. Lewis, yes. uh, real letters, official letters in the book that really drew me to this. And you get to see Lewis helping someone through their Christian journey. And so I'm reading this and I'm seeing them talk about Augustine, Chesterton, Charles William, uh, Dorothy Sayers, Lewis, of course. And I'm like, this was just a really great book to see two highly skeptical people mm-hmm. come to Christianity. And then even after that, there's another part of just their journey of dying to themselves, honestly, mm-hmm. and making the divine love beginning. So I really do love this book. That's, yeah. yeah. What about you, Andrew? What's what's your experience with it? You know, um, thanks for asking. I I think that I read this during my uh, mid-20s when I was at the kind of initial bloom of my rabid Lewis phase. I, I can't remember exactly where and when in my life I read it. But, um, but I was reading everything I could get my hands on. And of course, you know, this book comes up for a lot of folks. And so... Um, yeah, I, I read it. I, I swallowed it. I, I loved it. And this was when I was single, um, hadn't been married, had lots of idealism about marriage. And some of that, you know, was my own paganism, as we'll discuss with them, that needed to crumble. But I just fell in love with them falling in love with love. And oh my gosh, it just swept me away. And I'm like, oh, will I ever find a love like this? And then the Oxford part too. I mean, I had at this point, you know, loved Lewis so much that I longed to go to Oxford. And in fact, I used to joke that um, the first time I arrived in Oxford, I felt like I could walk everywhere and know exactly where I was. I'd studied so many pictures and maps and knew where things were. And this was, this contributed to me falling in love with Lewis falling in love with love, which had always, you know, been part of my conscious life and, and also falling in love with Oxford. And so I was completely swept away by it and then shocked later to find that, um, not everybody had the same response. Um, Mm -hmm. reading it again now, uh, I kind of, it kind of hit me differently. And, and what, what changes happened to you, uh, as you were, were rereading it? 
It did hit me a little bit differently. I would have, if you would have asked me in college, I would have put this in the top three books, 10 out of 10. I still think it's phenomenal. I highly recommend it to every one of our listeners. But yes, I, I would say I had a similar experience that I loved it. I got immersed in it. I could see the beauty in it. But I also, as I've maybe matured, because I read this when I was 21 and I'm 31 now, so 10 years later, life will do stuff to you. You'll have experienced romances, different kinds of loves, and you have seen beauty and brokenness in the world. Remember at this point, my life is college. I had no responsibility. College is honestly like a country club uh, in the United States. I mean, you have everything sort of, I mean, you're, you're, it's, it's just very different than the real world. And so, yeah, I would argue there was an idealism. I fell in love with the uh, idealism of their romantic relationship, the pagan love. And I would say this time there was a, a more tapered understanding where I saw the beauty in it. I, I could see the Christian-like elements that they had of that oneness for sure. But then I could also see the over-romanticizing, over-idealizing, making the other person the end of everything and some of the dangers in that pagan love that they had. Mm -hmm. And I would say, I could see how if I read it now without knowing the ending, you could potentially get put off within before you get to the parts that really, I think, I don't want to say save the first part because the first part doesn't need saving. Mm -hmm. But when you understand that this was a step towards a process of falling in love with divine love, it makes it a little bit easier, that pagan love to swallow. And there's still beauty in there. Um, but yes, there was a little bit of, uh, of idealism in there that maybe didn't hit me as much this time as it did the first time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I think that it's absolutely an important book. It's one I think really well worth considering. And so I'm glad that we're spending some time with it, at, especially at the end of uh, at the end of Four Loves. So, well, uh, I just saw you take a swig of something. What are you drinking today, Matt? Well, since we are drink doing this in the morning, I'm only drinking just some carbonated uh, spin drift. It's like LaCroix. Okay. Or as David would say, La Croix. La Croix. Yes. La Croix. Well, you know, we know that the English are always secretly enamored of the French. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I French. can't wait for him to hear this. <laughs> well, French was the court language uh, of, of England for many years. Well, I have my, having uh, moved away from Alexandria, Virginia, I'm now um, in Orlando area of Florida, Winter Garden, Florida, where I'll start my first post uh, as a minister. I'll be ordained in a couple of weeks. Um, but I was missing Texas this morning, so I have my Magnolia mug. Um, and I'm drinking some Texas coffee in it. I'm just uh, drinking taste of uh, uh, San Antonio blend, which was uh, Priscilla Tolkien's uh, favorite Texas mm -hmm. coffee, incidentally. So, and today I would like to uh, to cheers to our Patreon supporters, all of who, all of the ones who joined us the other day at the Wade Center for uh, watching that, doing the tour, and having a nice chat. So, here's to our Wade Patreon supporters. Cheers! Cheers! And to the Wade Center themselves. Indeed, indeed. Laura and David and Crystal and all of Marge and all of those. So cheers. Cheers. Oh, that was so bad. <laughs> okay. Let's hope that's, that clink is not representative of the episode without David. <laughs> by the way, listeners, I had a chance to, to spend a little time with Rowan Williams, the Archbishop of Canterbury, former Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, devoted Lewis fan. We've become friendly over the years, and he was our graduation speaker at Virginia Theological Seminary. Uh, and so a couple of weeks ago, he came over for tea and I gave him a Pints with Jack uh, pint glass and a, and, a, and a whiskey glass. So one of those is now in his house in Wales. So maybe we'll see if we can get him on at some point. So Well done. I love it. Yes. Well, let's, let's dive in. Yeah. I'll give a quick summary of just the book, just so people have a bit of a roadmap in their head. I'm not going to unpack these terms, but keep them in the back of your guys' mind. This book we're going to attempt to split this up into three parts. We're going to see how these conversations go. But this first part is this pagan love, and it's really over 10 years. And you're going to hear, you're going to hear terms of like the shining barrier where they really try to protect this in loveness. This, this appeal to love is another term where they constantly, when, when things get tougher, they have to make decisions or just differences. They always appeal to the love, the relationship, the unit, the oneness of it. There's this idea of the gray goose, uh, in, which is just this, this timelessness, this vision that they have. And this is all happening over about 10 years where they're in love. It's a pagan love. Yeah. Let me just, let me um, scroll out just a little bit. Um, so this is a story by uh, Sheldon Van Auken, 
um, about yep. the love that he had with his wife, uh, Davy, he called her. Um, so it's Van and Davy, and it's the story of their their life and their love. And they began began just they fell in love quickly as as young people in their early twenties, and uh, quickly married and developed this kind of almost pagan devotion to each other. Neither of them were believers. And so what they had was this incredible love. And it's this beautiful love story. I mean, you could easily make a movie of it. And and Van describes it very, very scenically. And so, um, but pretty early on, we find out that Davy is going to die. So it's a spoiler alert, but not really that much. In fact, um, Aristotle said, part of the reason that we're drawn to tragedy is we know how it's going to end. We just want to see how the author does it. And so... There really is this kind of Aristotelian draw. We know that Davy is going to get sick and die. Uh, and that's part of how they come to know Lewis and, 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 uh, and chat with him. So we kind of feel this fate coming. And so it's very poignant, very bittersweet as we see their young love developing. And so, yes, they do develop this shining barrier. They decide in complete sharing. They, uh, um, what is it? Creeping um, separateness. They try to avoid yes. any creeping separateness, and they're really just almost obsessed with each other and with their love, which in some ways, if you disallow God, um, they're turning to the one of the loves that is the closest to divine love, erotic love, and they devote themselves to it. So they have both dismissed Christianity, and they've both devoted themselves to each other. And so probably 20 years or so after, uh, after Davy's death, Van Auken writes this book, and I believe he wrote it in like six weeks or something. I mean, it really, mm. he was under this kind of passion, this fury, not, not unlike the, 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 um, the Messiah, which came quite quickly, um, Handel's Messiah. And so he writes this kind of swooning, sweeping, um, very sweet, and, but he's reflecting about things from many, many years before. And so that's kind of what, where this book is. I'm glad you took a step back and went even higher. Because another way I've heard someone phrase this to me is it's it's like a love story falling in love with capital L love mm -hmm. himself. Mm -hmm. So it starts with the pagan love, mm -hmm. transitions to a Christian love. But even after they become Christian, there's a there's a journey of, okay, you've accepted Christ, but do you fall in love where you give yourself fully over to capital L love mm -hmm. and just what that journey looks like. And so I, I'm glad you took a step back and did that. And so yeah, so you've got the you got the pagan love the ten years you've got the the Oxford period which is going to be a very critical period very much when they he calls it the encounter with light when there comes to Christianity when there's interactions with Lewis then there's this post Oxford period for mm -hmm. about a year he calls it the little little dreary uh, the barrier has been breached not to uh, tease a little bit too much there um, appeal to love is a little bit in jeopardy there's some jealousy that's going on in that period and then finally the deathly time in the reflection afterwards uh, and so that's how this is this the progression of this book is going to go but we are going to start with the pagan love and that's what this episode is going to be on and so Andrew let's start with the shining barrier I'm going to reread that quote from the beginning real quick just as a reminder to people if you are not listening to the very intro quote a week but <laughs> The shining barrier, the shield of our love, this walled garden, a fence around a young tree to keep the deer from nibbling it. Talks about, and yet in another sense, it was our love itself made strong within. That was the shining barrier, like this green tree of love they're trying to protect. So it's very much this in loveness that wanted to be protected. And they um, they loved poetry, they loved music and art, yes. and they realized, especially as pagans, that there's lots of stuff that could interrupt their love, um, other family members, in-laws, whatever, their own selfishness. And they quickly realized that they should, they should push all of that to the outside. And um, another piece of it was this kind of complete sharing. Um, they shared absolutely everything. Uh, the quote from the book is, the killer of love is creeping separateness. In loveness is a gift from the, of the gods, but then it is up to the lovers to cherish or to ruin. Taking love for granted, especially after marriage, ceasing to do things together. Um, they only, uh, they read all the same books. And in fact, they endeavored to read every book that the other had read. They were absolutely devoted to themselves. 
and to their love. And so if anybody found anything that they enjoyed, even if the other didn't enjoy it, the other learned enough about it to be able to appreciate and accept it. So there was absolutely nothing in between them. And of course, those are great ideals, but then human life creeps in. And so they dealt with kind of the struggles of, of self, but they really set out very deliberately. And, and to me, that was where the, the hook really went into my mouth when I first read it. I was on the line. I was I was hooked. The bait of how to maintain this beautiful, perfect love, especially for somebody who was lonely in his 20s. Um, I mean, I was I was sold and I so wanted to find a love that was that was like that. Did that it, did that affect you the same way? Matt? Well, before that, I want to ask you, ask you yeah. a question as as the resonant scholar in marriage, because you're actually married <laughs> and, you know, a yes. good bit about Lewis's four loves. <laughs> what what is your thoughts on just the idea of sharing everything, not the separateness yet, but like just to sharing everything because you know, there's, there's debates that opposites attract and there's, there's conversations that, you know, wait, what you two, like the similarities. And so right. what's your view of they, is it that they just take it to extreme, but there's some truth to it. Um, do, do you think married couples need to share that many interests, that much overlap? Just, just talk around that a bit. Yeah. You know, I think it's a great question. Um, to cast it into the terms of the four loves, I think what they're doing is making, we talked about all season about how love becomes a demon um, when it becomes a god. And so of the three natural loves, family love, friendship love, and romantic love, what they really do is they make romantic love the chief god. And so mm -hmm. they won't even let their families, their in-laws come through the shining barrier you know, if anybody's opposed to them on either side, they really shut them out. And so that kind of exalts Eros over Storgi. The idea of complete sharing, I think, is incorporating into Eros um, philia. And so if one of them had a, a friendly interest in something, and, and friendship is about sharing of interest, if one of them was interested, the other had to share it. And so they kind of amalgamate uh, friendship into Eros. And then they consider themselves kind of the primary story unit, almost to the exclusion of all others. As I read it oh, again- children. <laughs> right. As we, as we bring up, I mean, they, they, were, they were not even to let children into this. No. Uh, they thought that children would spoil their marriage. Um, I'm overdrawing it, of course. but And so they decided against that. Um, they were so infatuated with each other. Um, as a married person, I mean, there's part of this that just, you know, I find, again, really attractive. I think that it's, you know, I, I was reading it and I'm like, man, I need to love my wife better, you know. Um, but it also seemed very young and very idealistic. Um, and I would have loved to have seen, gosh, I don't wish that they hadn't become Christians, but I wonder what would have happened to the Shining Barrier as they grew older. I mean, what would have been, mm -hmm. would they have had the shining barrier in their 50s and 60s and 70s? And so it seems very much kind of breathless and heady. And of course, that's the way that, that falling in love has to has to start. And, and in some ways, the, the falling in love is what leads us to make these brash, incredible promises to love somebody for the rest of your life. And we can't possibly know how that's going to look for 20 years. And so in some ways, I think that it's it's really, it shows one of the purposes of love in a legitimate Christian marriage. Falling in love allows you to make these vows um, to exclude all others. And so in some ways, they're embodying the, the, Christian, the Christian marriage ceremony. In fact, there's a quick quote I wanted to, I wanted to read. It stuck out as I was rereading. Um, for me, it's on page 39, but of course, I've got the deluxe Davies edition with, you know, extra pictures and... No way. I didn't yeah. even know that existed. Oh, yeah. Um, Pagans that we were, Van says, we were not reminded of Christ's one flesh for marriage. If we had been, we might have felt a faint alliance with him, right? And so they were trying to become one flesh, but... um but they were doing it from the pagan sense. Um, by the way, here's the, uh, let's see if I can, I'm showing. Oh, I see that. That's picture. beautiful. That's the picture that, um, that a lot of the, a lot of the books have, but then there's more pictures. Mm. And I love the pictures of her. They really kind of capture, uh, capture who she was. Well, and I'd say, you know, going back to that, that, um, 
closeness. So th- this this wasn't the part that hooked me the first time around. I don't know if I blew through this part pretty fast. It wasn't that it didn't hook me per se, but the big thing for me was the Oxford side of things. I had just yeah. got back from Oxford. That really hooked me in the book. But yep. I would say when I read it this time, I could see with the wisdom of Lewis, you you I did struggle with this period, this part a little bit because it was so centered on the other. And Lewis talks so much about how it's important to not be making your significant other the end, but you guys are both like going side by side towards something together. And for them, the, each other was the end. And so I think your your comments and your question of what would have happened if they did this for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, I'd really be genuinely curious what would have happened. Mm-hmm. And I'm Honestly, though, I'm pretty impressed that they were able to maintain it so strongly for 10 years where mm-hmm. the other was just the end. Because at some point you would assume either lack of fulfillment starts to come in because the person doesn't fulfill all of your joys and all of your needs and your longings and your happiness. Maybe they would have gotten to the gray goose and realized that didn't bring their happiness, their joy, their longings. So for listeners, the the, the gray goose was a yacht yep. that they had built and they planned to um, just sail around the world and enjoy themselves and enjoy sailing and visiting all these lands. And, and then they, you know, they didn't have to be tied down and they could always be together. And so they ended up teaching themselves how to sail and building this, this yacht called the Grey Goose and, and taking it around. And so that was a, a huge shift towards each other, you know, for them. Yes. And we'll talk about that in a second, because I do want us to dive into the idea of that and that timelessness. But I'm curious with The Shining Barrier, you and the pagan love, I'm going to ask you a little bit different question too here. Mm-hmm. How do you think, the, what parts of this pagan love, this complete oneness, making each other the end, protecting that in loveness, sharing all the interness, pre- preventing separateness is similar to a Christian love, like that you would endorse, that you would say that they were onto something that was beautiful. And what part would you say, this is against what Christian love teaches, this is dangerous? Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what distinctions would you make there? That's a great question, and actually, it it um it allows me to kind of beat on my on one of my hobby horses. The idea, the word pagan, uh, probably needs some contextualization and some definition. Yes, because I've spent almost half my life in the South, and and pagan is usually somebody who's not behaving right. And it's like that boy's a pagan. He's out like going crazy on Saturday night. Um, <laughs> pagan literally means believing in many gods. That's all that that means. It means polytheist, right? And it means also, by extension, somebody who doesn't necessarily accept the exclusive divinity of Christ and the and the Christian religion. So, um, pagan is not a pejorative term. Remember that Lewis called himself a converted pagan in a land of apostate Puritans, right? And so paganism appealed to Lewis. He loved the dying and rising God in every different religion. That's paganism. Paganism is somebody who, you know, will will take from a lot of different religions or a lot of different gods. And did Chesterton say he would be a pagan if he wasn't a Christian? Probably. Because he thought yeah. it was the the better alternative of like, he, he, at least the way he somewhat describes it is of, if this um, pagans love nature, they worship love, they worship food, they worship pleasures, they worship mother nature, they worship like, you know, a lot of different, like he, he thought if Christianity wasn't true, that was the second best option. Yep. Um, not some of these other ones. And Lewis came from that kind of devotion to beauty, this, this, this non-Christian mm-hmm. pagan love. And so they called themselves pagans. Um, they were probably in fact agnostic. And later he says that we were actually theists. We believe that yep. something big and good, you know, created this marvelous world that we have. And so in that sense, I think a devotion and he, he keys in on it in the early chapters really well. He says the problem is self, Right. And the thing that the problem between him and Davy would have been their own selfishness. Well, we've harped upon that, and I've harped upon that. You know, every episode that I've ever spoken of, self or love is going out of the self towards the other. And in some ways, their pagan love embodies this selflessness. So they had no disagreements. They worked through all their disagreements, and the question was always, "What is best for us?" Right. Um, uh, what what's best for our love and this devotion to the other, this selflessness, uh, this self forgetfulness, and it wasn't Van forgetting himself for the sake of Davy. It was Van and Davy forgetting their individualness 
for the sake of their shining barrier of their own kind of uh, beautiful pagan love. And that was called the appeal to love. Right. What's love. best for our love. And so mm-hmm. I think that, that any time you are going out of yourselves towards the other, that's the first step on the road to the love of God. Absolutely. The enemy, of course, screw tape is going to try to screw that up. And certainly he did try to screw that up in their, in their own life. And it was, uh, I think Van is kind of idealistic when he writes this book some 20 or 30 years later, you know, and it seems like they were perfect at it. And even their disagreements or their falling short, um, they, you know, he shows and then it always ended in giggles and cuddles and love. And, you know, it's like, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure how, <laughs> how realistic that was. And so, Might but this BS is on that. Yeah. But there's a guy in his twenties and early thirties, um, falling in love with this amazing partner and then losing her and going through that grief and then reflecting back on how good that was. So I think that there's a little bit of loss and grief that paints uh, how he describes it. But in terms of their pagan love, I think there's so many elements of that that point directly towards divine love. For me, one of the things that I thought, well, first, actually, extending back to that Chesterton conversation on paganism, I I believe it was Chesterton that also said, Christianity saves paganism from itself. Mm-hmm. So it essentially lets you know your desires, your love of beauty, your love of nature, your love of love, how far they should go, but not any further. That was his big point. Mm-hmm. And Lewis, I think, very much agreed with that. And so it, it showed you how far to go, but then no further. And, and if you left paganism to itself, it would lead to a dangerous conclusion in the end because it would make gods of all these things. And as we know with Lewis, things that become gods become demons. I think a very similar thing is here, exactly what you said, that two become one, the fleshness that going out Mm -hmm. is very Christian, very beautiful. Mm -hmm. The difference that I, there's multiple differences we could go into, but the main one that I thought was, it was for the wrong end. Mm -hmm. It was for each other. And Mm -hmm. so we'll talk about this later, but in, in another part actually, so not on this episode, but Lewis points out to them, it was like us, then us and God, than God and us. Like God needed to ultimately be number one. So in the beginning, it's just them and everything is for them towards their end to the point of excluding like children, mm-hmm. which there's nothing wrong with, but like the, the, how extreme that was. Like mm-hmm. it was just like, we're, we're, we will not let anything get in the way of us. Like it was to a very strict end of them. And so I was, I, I thought that was a very big difference from the Christian love. You know, the oneness is for something more usually. Wouldn't that in some ways just go against Catholic policy? that you would necessarily exclude children. I mean, I think that uh, I yes. think that uh, Catholic the- theology would find that in some ways really hateful. Um, yes. And they're fundamentally, I think that their selflessness towards each other was fundamentally selfish because they it's were trying to keep it. this. Agree. Yeah. Yeah. And create this love that, that worked for them. So, yeah. And so of course God's going to come in and, and mess around with that anytime we do that. Well, now let's let's jump to what you've you uh, briefly teased and alluded to earlier: the gray goose. This is another theme, and so you know they have this in love, they have this protectness. There's a very big key part of their journey is this gray goose, which is this boat that they're constructing, this vision of going around the world. And the word that I use to really describe this is a timelessness, mm-hmm. and, and we will unpack that much further. Uh, in the back part of this uh, book, because he unpacks that concept of timelessness and the way that it uh, pointed to it. But the first thing I want to say is gray goose. This is a fun little fact, and that's very fitting to them. Gray goose, literally the gray goose, don't think of the vodka, means if it's mate, I shouldn't say means, that's a dumb way. The gray goose literally acts this way. It's an animal. If its mate is killed, flies on alone and never takes another. Like that's how strong their their thing was i guess um but here's something they say here with the gray goose the gray goose was initially only a means to an end the good life the timeful life but our imaginations were more and more caught up in the grace and beauty of the ships and the sea we would sail the seas and storm and sunshine to far islands carrying with us our beloved books and our few possessions and we would be free free to be free from schedules <laughs> and this, I remember this part hitting me, particularly when he talks, circles back to this at the end of the book to unpack this, but that timelessness, I've experienced this. I've experienced this, and I think many people can relate to this. It's that idea that we 
we almost hold up on a pedestal traveling. I've done that. Well, when I can get to this place, we save up to go travel for a couple of weeks and we have this beautiful vision of going here or living in a new location. Or for me, Oxford was this. I remember I had this idea when I was trying to get into Oxford that this was going to be the moment. And it was shattered when I got there when I realized it wasn't everything I built it up for. Career success, the next achievement very much for me is something similar to their Grey Goose. It's like this timeless vision I have in the future that once I get there or I experience this or I do this, it's going to fulfill that longing and that joy that I've been desiring. And then you get there and it's not there, but you then you assume, well, it it just wasn't quite enough. I just Mm. need a little bit more. Mm. Um, Can you relate to that? I was just talking with a, a parishioner at my new parish yesterday, and they were describing how they had read a lot of self-help books in their 20s um, mm-hmm. because with their upbringing, both with academics and with other activities, if they followed the program, they had success and they got approval. And that was part of their upbringing in their family. That was part of their their extracurricular activities, their academic activities. And then they got into their career in their 20s. And they said, I read a ton of self-help books and I kept trying to find the formula. And he said, or they said, um, with their devotional life, they spend an hour a day, you know, with their, with their devotions, but, um, but always felt like it was a pass fail. Mm-hmm. about their devotional life. Did I do my Bible reading today? Did I do my prayer today? Whatever. And I didn't get a chance to ask them, but the question that popped into my mind was when your devotional life becomes pass fail, yes, I did it. I'm okay. Or no, I didn't. No, I didn't do it. I'm terrible. Which is more dangerous, passing or failing when it comes mm-hmm. to your devotional life? And I wonder if passing isn't maybe more dangerous because it relies on my own efforts, right? I would argue that um, we're going to talk about this later because I have it in here. Uh, it depends. Mm-hmm. It, for, the only reason I say this is because I'm thinking back of Lewis has an answer here on prayer because he really wrestles with it. Now I'm jumping way ahead here, but I think it fits. Yeah, here. it fits uh, together. Yeah, he asks him uh, by uh, he, I mean, Van asks Lewis. He's really struggling. His wife has died. She offered it up. He was having a hard time letting go and if he didn't make her the end, would God have taken her away and this? And so it ends up leading to a bit of a discussion that Lewis has on prayer and whether it's answered or not. And there was four outcomes that came from this. And here's what they were. The worthiness of the petitioner made it bad for him to have his prayer granted because it might lead him to think there was an element of bargain to it. And let me back up just a just a bit. Yeah. And this is spoiler alert. The book is called A Severe Mercy because Lu- when Davy dies, um, and Van had been kind of a reluctant believer, and Davy's death in some ways served Van as an invitation to greater devotion to the Lord. And so it's not like God killed Davy because Van wasn't you know having his quiet time. But Lewis remarks to Van, maybe this death is a severe mercy to you. Maybe this, Mm -hmm. you know, because God won't be, won't be thwarted. um, And maybe God can use this to make you more like himself. And of course, the great irony is that this would probably echo in Lewis's own, own ears because it was not long after this that Lewis lost his own wife. And so, so this is the context for, so when Van prayed for David to get well, this is what you're talking about. And here, those are the possible outcomes. Yes. And so he literally says the worthiness of the petitioner can actually make it bad for the prayer to be granted because you can think there's an element of bargain because I'm good. I got the prayer. And he also says the unworthiness might make it that the prayer can't be granted because it might lead him to think that God did not demand righteousness. So if you're unworthy and you get your prayer granted, you might realize you can just live your life doing whatever and just asking God for things. And that's not a good outcome. He says the worthiness could make it good for the prayer to be answered because it might free the individual from scruples, showing him that his conduct had been right after all. You know, he's in communion with God. The unworthiness might make it good to be answered because it might humble the person. It's like the conclusion of all of this was it's really hard to read into circumstances. And I think my takeaway from that was God. God is going to do its best for your heart and, and best for your soul and your salvation. And I don't remember what led me to do this, what you were talking about before this, Andrew. So bring me back to what you were before so I can pull it full circle. What were you saying? Well, and let me let me tack on to this. I was uh, recently in Houston for a couple of days, and St. Cecilia's Church in West Houston invited me to give a talk on Lewis. 
and it was a joy to be amongst them. Um, and one of the things I discovered during my talk, um, I hadn't really planned it, it wasn't in my notes, but I was mentioning Lewis going to Cambridge and giving lectures. And he said, my lectures have never been more poorly attended uh, than here in Cambridge. Um, and that certainly changed. Soon, you know, people were thronging. Um, a former student of Lewis's once told me that you could tell where Lewis was about to lecture because the bicycles were piled three deep outside of the lecture hall. But at the beginning, <laughs> he didn't have that kind of success. And he said, they've never been more poorly, uh, more poorly attended. It's probably frightfully good for me. Mm -hmm. which is this incredible, incredibly humble reaction. And so uh, Lewis has got an essay called Petitionary Prayer, A Problem Without a Solution. Listeners, when we pray and ask for something and God says no or doesn't say anything, whatever God's response to our prayer, to our petitionary prayers, is frightfully good for us, even if it is not the thing that we particularly want. Because God is only going to allow, in response to our prayers, what is best for our souls. In some ways, I think Davy and Van were trying to do this. Let's do only what's best for our love. But they were doing it humanly, imperfectly, and they didn't allow for Christ who would come crashing in. But I love that phrase, this terrible thing is probably frightfully good for me. And so to say yes to untoward circumstances, not as you were enunciating, you know, the, the four different approaches to prayer, not because I'm a glutton for punishment, not because God is cruel, but because even this thing that I wouldn't have chosen, God will use this in order to improve my soul. And this is the very heart of what happened with Davy and Van. You know, they tried everything they could to make their love exclusive of all else. Even had they gone on without meeting Christ, Davy probably would have still gotten ill and died. And so in some ways, God comes in in the unfortunate circumstances of our life to remind us that this world is not, a, is not the end. And this world is not our home. Sometimes, and it's hard for me to, to say this in the midst of a house full of boxes, sometimes the irritation and uncomfortability of life is to remind me that this home that I'm literally setting up, we got boxes all over the downstairs and we're picking where the pictures go and we're arguing about this and agreeing about that. But God wants to, and I didn't realize that this till we, till we started this morning, God wants to remind me that this house is not my home. This house will positively echo the mansion God is preparing for me, but this house should also leave me wanting for that house and show itself as insufficient. And I think that sometimes what God most wants for us is for us to un understand the insufficiency of our own loves, of this life, and of this world to keep us longing for heaven where we're made whole. Mm, I like that. I have a lot of thoughts, but for the sake of time, <laughs> sorry, move on got to, to the preach next thing. No, 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 I love it. That's what we're here for, Andrew. That's what we're here for. I'm just my job is just to tee it up and I'll let you <laughs> no, run. No, no, I love, I love our conversations together. And so, yeah, this I and this I idea that the ideal of the gray ghost would be the thing. If we got to that thing, that that would be the thing. But it isn't. All of those things will mm -hmm. run out and leave us dry. And even when we get you know, get to Egypt and we find that, you know, that our son is now the second in charge, you know, only to Pharaoh and we have safety from famine and everything. And it, well, even there someday a Pharaoh will arise who does not know Joseph, right? And so God will continually, the enemy will continually try to, to mess with us, but God will continually use those pinpricks to remind us that we have a better home waiting for us. And that's, I think, what happened to, to Davy and Van. That's why I think it's really important not to judge people. And the reason I say that is we don't know how many more mistakes a person will need before they realize it. Mm -hmm. Maybe you are one of the lucky ones that very early on in life recognize what won't bring happiness and what will bring happiness. Maybe you never gave into the physical desires of the world, status, wealth, pleasure, alcoholism, lust, and the gluttony. And you just knew that God was the answer to everything. And that's wonderful. And <laughs> praise be to God that you, you experienced that very early on in life. There's many that haven't yet, and they might experience it in their 
20s. They might experience in their 30s, their 40s, or 50s, or 60s, or 70s, or 80s, or their 90s. And so they might have to, unfortunately, go on a journey of experiencing the emptiness of those things to a deeper degree before they realize the true emptiness of them. Mm. It always actually saddens me when I see people judging people in that state because I'm like, I almost wonder if the person doing the judging is actually feeling the fullness of the joy because they feel like a need to like judge the person doing the other thing. There should be a sympathy, a, a sadness, like a desire to, to like help this individual realize what they're looking for is, is Christ, is God. Mm. And once you found it, you want to share that with them. And so I think the prodigal son needed to go to the point of blowing everything that they had, Mm -hmm. uh, he had before and coming back to his heavenly father. And so I think there's a, there's just a lesson here of this, this, this timelessness, this seeking for more, these ideals that are meant to fill this hole. Really it's everyone is on a different journey of how long before they realize that. Well, and you know, as I grow older, I think that's exactly right. And I love that you, that you bring that up. Um, It reminds me of the prodigal, the, the prodigal brother the older brother and the mm. prodigal son, and which circles us back to screw tape. And I'm paraphrasing mm. ridiculously, unrecognizably here. Um, but uh, screw tape says something to the effect of, let's give him chastity so long as we can get, get him to have pride about it, right? Yes. Those people who don't have to struggle, what screw tape wants is for them to feel self-satisfied and prideful because pride mm. is the mm. grossest of sins. And so- those people who have lived righteously, and I'm not advocating, you know, unrighteous living. Remember what Lewis said, that a, a prostitute may be closer to the spirit of Christ than a cold-hearted prig. But remember what Lewis says, it's better to be neither. <laughs> um, right? And that cold-hearted prig is maybe this person that you're drawing up who, you know, never did all of those terrible things, but then they begin to think that it depended on them, that they're better because of their choices. And pride is spiritual cancer. Pride eats away at everything else. And so somebody who is gleefully you know, indulging in the kind of pagan lusts, desires, you know, sins as Van and Davy were. It's somebody who's gleefully rejecting God, but really enjoying love. You could almost see that their love for love was going to lead them to love himself, right? Where the people who sat back and judged them were already a million miles away from the self-abandonment of love. And so once again, we come back to this theme that I'll never shut up about. I love it. Well, the next part of of their journey massively paraphrases and goes super quickly. I mean, honestly, I think he he condenses 10 years into like five pages. He calls it the mid-morning and mainly because like the springtime, the morning of their love. And here's a quote that pretty much sums it up. There was to be much of the seas, both ships and yachts, in these colorful and adventurous years, years that were to include, besides the fancy and the yachts, a great university, Yale, in a Virginia, Virginian farmhouse. And so they kept that shining barrier going. They kept that love. But near the end of this, before they head on to Oxford, I want us to talk about one other thing. And that was, he has a chapter titled called The Shadow of a Tree. And I decided to put The Hound of Heaven too, because Mm -hmm. he didn't title the chapter that, but he uses that to to describe Jesus, kind of hounding them, coming towards them from heaven. And there was two incidents that happened in this period. Uh, his was, I believe, more early on. I'm not sure exactly where hers falls in the 10-year period. But uh, for him, when he's on a, he part of the Navy and he's on a, a ship and she's coming out to him, this destroyer's coming out, and I guess there's a mast and as it's coming, he notices the way it, it like crossed itself, that it looked like the cross, a Christian cross, the cross of Christ. So the shadow falls across Davy, but it's it's a cross. It's a shadow of a cross that's just incidentally parts of the ship. But he sees there her overshadow as a cross. And in retrospect, he sees that as in some ways very symbolic. Yes. And in that moment, it actually it planted the seed too of, of he should someday explore this Christianity thing. And then he tabled it, put it in the back of his mind, and it comes back up later in a time as Oxford. And then there's a moment for Davy where, and this is a really pivotal moment in hindsight, I think, where she gets this conviction of sin, but there's also a pain that happens here. So she's in a park, if I remember this correctly, and she's just reading, I would say, enjoying her time in this uh, gentleman, fully exposed, comes running at her. 
And it's very traumatic, I would imagine, because you're wondering what's going to happen. I mean, it's a sexual assault. And what that could have turned into had she not got away is probably pretty scary to think about. But she gets away and gets back. And and then that night, she's, I think, a little bit shook up, but then she's crying. And uh, Van comes back. And interestingly enough, she doesn't actually bring that up as the reason for her tears. It was like that night, she also got this conviction of sin. She started seeing, now they didn't use that language then. He uses that with a post-Christian lens as he's rewriting this. But she looks over her life and sees her own sins. And Van points out, they're not, they don't seem to be that big of sins, but she's you know, pointing out pride and arrogance and times when she's like shot people down for values. She, I think she even talks about a Roman Catholic in a circumstance and just ways that she treated people with neglect or contempt, um, maybe a little bit more diabolical sins she actually notices. And it really shakes her up. This doesn't lead to Christianity yet, but these two, it leads her to draw this painting, which is uh, the painting of sin or something, they call it. Um, but, oh, no, this, well, they call the painting the shadow of a tree. And so she ends up drawing this painting or painting this painting that's like a tree that looks like the crucified Messiah with her soul looking like a ghost-like wraith. Is this a tree? The sin picture. No way. That's it? That's it. Oh, this is the book we need. Oh, we got to put this in the show notes so people can see what it is. Yeah. I don't have that picture, so I didn't know what the sin picture looked like. I would have sort of... I would have sort of thought that because she says the soul looked ghost and wraith-like. So she almost saw a brokenness to her, a brokenness to the world. And what I thought here, they don't use this language, but it will connect to what we'll talk about in other parts is they had not only created the shining barrier of their love, but almost this perfection of the world. Mm -hmm. you know, they came from a nicer upbringing. Um, there was a bit of, of privilege there for sure. They're talking about going around in yachts and just doing their own thing and being separate and free from the world. And a lot of it almost seems like responsibility to some degree. And now they're in this moment where she's seeing her brokenness, but then that that experience of the homeless or I think it's a homeless person, but the person running at her uh, really shook her up shattered her worldview or challenged it or poked it might be the better way to just to phrase it. Well, and I think it kind of goes back to what I was saying before, this kind of thing that's frightfully good for her. So yeah, she's sitting on a park bench and some, you know, pervert comes up to him and ex comes up to her and exposes himself to her and then starts chasing her. And she says mm -hmm. that she felt like prey um, and she gets mm -hmm. away. Van doesn't say this and I'm maybe just kind of connecting the dots in my own way. But, you know, a lot of times when somebody's victimized, there's at least an element to go, what did I do to deserve this? Ah, and certainly there's that a lot insight. of times in sexual, you know, in sexual assault. Um, of course, she did nothing to deserve it, but God used the experience of being chased, being ex being exposed to and, and chased as a way for her to go, okay, here's sin, what are my own sins? And we're not quite sure how that jump happens, but she begins to be convicted of sins. And Van kind of is dismissive of all of that, but mm -hmm. um, looks back and sees that as a real step on her spiritual journey to realize that there's sin in the world, but there's also sin inside of herself, that even behind the shining bar barrier and the great love, what is in her is fundamentally weak. There's a, a fundamental brokenness in all of us. And and that's one of the things that did strike me about this rereading re this book. And part of that is my own education and the way of our world uh, these days. But I was aware of the kind of glib um, privilege that they had as white people. They had African-American servants and they celebrated the South a little bit. And yeah, they had they could go to their father's club and they didn't seem to need to raise any money in order to to build this ship. And and they talked about if they had children, well, we could get nannies. <laughs> right. You know, and they they enjoyed this incredible privilege. And looking back at it now with our modern eyes, they didn't even seem to acknowledge that all of this stuff was handed to them, you know. Um, but still, even in this idyllic life, I think the, the, the situation serves, even though they had this kind of almost perfect life, they still, their own selves, their own shortcomings, the sin of the world was still creeping in. And they may have thought mm -hmm. that they created a shining barrier, 
But at the heart of the shining barrier inside it was still two fallen and human people. And screw tape's going to try and uh, try and get to them. Um, that takes a turn as we come to our favorite city, but um, but still, it's all yes. right there. Well, and related to that, I want to point out too. I think what's so beautiful about what I do love about their journey is, despite the, what you what you what you just said, which I agree with, there was there was a genuine authenticity to them, their desires. They didn't they they didn't have like malicious bones. They didn't intend to be wanting to like be better than others or things like that. They really just they had a desire for happiness and joy and to live purely in the best that they thought. And the reason I I use the word genuine and authentic is because I'm a believer that if you're genuine and authentically searching for the meaning of life or truth, that our Lord won't won't leave you hanging. And notice that he he worked with that. You know, he took that, shattered that shining barrier, <laughs> shattered that appeal to love. Um, did some pretty rough stuff, like mm-hmm. went in there and really knocked stuff around. But they were open to it at every step of the way, which I thought was beautiful. So despite some of the upbringing and stuff like that, there was just a very much an openness to truth, to suffering, to pain, to mm-hmm. that. And little did they know it was going to come flooding in many ways. Um, but I, I, I do appreciate that. I think it's what Lewis says in his second best book, that no soul that seriously (laughs) or constantly desires joy will ever miss it. And so what they are searching for ultimately is not themselves, but God. And God comes Mm -hmm. crashing in inconveniently, uh, but that's really what they wanted. And I think that in retrospect, Van would have said, I would much rather have had Christ on the worst of circumstances than just Davy and not Christ, you know, in the Mm -hmm. best. Um, because, you know, what does it say at the end of your Christianity? Look for yourself, and in the end, you'll only find rage, ruin, decay, decay, loss, and despair. But look for Christ, and you will find him. And with him, everything else thrown in. They were trying to find everything else thrown in in just themselves. And God breached that shining barrier, even by way of the, the sinful world and the fallen world and decay and disease, and even use that to, um, to, to purify both of their faiths. I love it. Well, as you said, this is where we're going to wrap up this part. And oh, we might need to save that sound and throw that in many times. That's the bell for the uh, last call. That is the bell for the last call. So as Andrew said, this is going to be wrapping up before they go to Oxford. So this is the end of that period. This will be the last thing I will leave from a quote from here is he says, what is important is that the moment was a culmination of all we had ever dreamt, not just gray goose, not just a good life, the time full life without the pressure of time, but also the green tree of the pagan love flourishing within the shining barrier, still in love, still outward bound. We were leaving this gray goose way for a little while, but only for a little while. So this is their mindset as they're finishing up the season, going to Oxford. So even though we just talked about the conviction of sin and what's sort of happening, you know, it's because we know where things are going. But at this point, you know, those were just kind of one off, shook them up. They don't realize what's about to happen as they go on to Oxford. And so that's what we're going to pick up the next part. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this bit, bit different format uh, with Andrew and I doing this a little bit more of just a conversation around the different key parts. Uh, but we really do appreciate you guys joining us for this. And we're going to continue with this part two and part three and dive more into the Christian side. And then more importantly, the, uh, after they become Christians, what that looks like. Well, and I can't wait till our next discussion. I mean, and for me, looking forward to Oxford when I first read this. And now uh, yes. in two months, wow, two months from right now, I'll be in the middle of my my latest trip to, to Oxford. And so uh, I can't wait to get there and to get to Lewis. I think that that part of the book for me you know, is really the highlight. So as we wrap up, we want to, of course, thank uh, all of you for spending the hour with us and especially our Patreon supporters, particularly our top tier supporters that include Angela, Deborah number one, Deborah number two, and Marvin, uh, Joel, Thomas, Anani Mouse, Bill and Joanna, Snort and Bud, Shane, John, Kevin, Brian and Kay, Paul and Kimberly, Gillis, Gary, Stephen, Matt and Kelly, Chris, John, James, Peter, David, and Rowdy. So, if you'd enjoyed, uh, if you've enjoyed this uh, this 
this edition, this this episode, please share it with a friend. And you can find it, of course, wherever good podcasts are downloadable. And please join us next time when we'll be going further up and further in. Cheers. Cheers. That's the perfect sound. <laughs> <laughs>